knows, urinating, you know, all the orifices, described as a route of departure for intruding objects and demons. Because it is thought that the demons actually got in through the orifices. So, throw them out of the orifices through which they enter. So, purge them out, sneeze them out, cough them out, piss them out, vomit them out. And they also had this unique tradition where a frog was fried in oil and then put topically over the skin to relieve pain. And there was always incantations to the god named Horus to help them in times whenever they underwent pain. If you look at the Inca civilization, which you're aware is in South America, somewhere in the region of Peru, they also had a civilization before the Incas, the pre-Inca civilization. In the pre-Inca civilization, along with the Egyptian civilization, there was a habit of chewing to cocoa. I was about to say tobacco, but <laughs> cocoa. Chewing cocoa was also thought to alleviate pain. Next slide, please. So, some of the earliest people known to mankind who spoke about health issues and their understanding are people whom we are very familiar with, people like Hippocrates, Plato, Aristotle. Now these people try to explain their understanding on the root causes of pain. They were philosophers, they were physicians, they were artists, like people of those times were, you know, they were having multiple facets. So they spoke about the philosophy and understanding of the human anatomy. The next slide, please. Now, the father of medicine, Hippocrates, believed that pain was caused by an imbalance in the vital fluids of the human body, which is phlegm and water. So whenever there was an imbalance in these vital fluids, people became diseased, people had pain. Now, at that time, Neither Aristotle nor Hippocrates believed that the brain had any role to play in brain processing. Rather, they implicated the heart as the central origin of the sensation of pain. Now, it's very interesting to note. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, that because it was a thing of the heart, an experiential part of the understanding of pain, the stimulus which caused that came from outside. So it's something like an alien or an independent being which is invading the human body to take over it. The good part is that Plato and his disciple Aristotle believed pain to have an emotional component. That's the most important part of our understanding of pain now. So Dr. Ray, as well as uh, Dr. Bhatta would have talked a little bit about the understanding of the emotional context of pain, which we give a lot of emphasis today. And we have even a workshop on mindfulness. So this happened very, very long time back. But remember, for them, the seat of the whole thing was the heart, nothing to do with the brain. Next slide, please. Now this is the best part of it. Around the same time, Herophilus, Aristratus, Aristratus, it's a tongue twister for me, whatever we pronounce, Aristratus, who lived also before Christ, 300 years before Christ, actually had an understanding that all this happened in the brain. In fact, the student of Pythagoras, Herophilus, these are the people who actually thought that pain was experienced by things which are happening in the nerves and the brain around the time of Plato and Aristotle. And Aristotle, who was also known as the father, grandfather of anatomy, dissected the human body at that time. There were public dissections and they traced the nerves to the brain 
and said, look, it's the brain which is the seat of all this. And Galen also supported this. Now Galen, although he supported, he did have his own theories of the soul and the spirit. So for him, it was not just the physical brain, but also some movement of the spirit and the soul in understanding. If you look at the picture below there, um, that's the diagram of the anatomy of the dissection. Um, on one side by Galen, but the other side by Aristratus, more, more detailed by Aristratus. So these people actually believe this way. Next slide, please. Despite this, what I mean to say is that despite this understanding, Plato and Aristotle prevailed for a very, very long time into making mankind believe that look heart is the center of the whole thing. Because they were philosophers of a different genre and they could convince people better and it is not just about pain, they had philosophies. If, if you look at the philosophies of Aristotle and Plato, there are a lot of other things to talk on. So who would you believe, Plato or, uh, uh, or Galen? I would go for Plato at that time. But now we know that the others were correct. In the Mesopotamian, in the Judeo-Hebraic cultures, pain is considered to be a central metaphor or a test of faith in God. So they believed that the pleasure was balanced against pain to determine the good of the society. So pain was an external force or an act of God as a kind of penalty or a test of faith in him. Next slide, please. So with the Renaissance, there was a lot of change in understanding of pain. When things were thought to be a little different from that of spirits, animal spirits, and soul, to what's happening at a physical level. So one of the most important proponents of that time was René Descartes. So René Descartes, uh, during the Middle Age of the Renaissance, refuted the idea that pain came from outside. So in 1664, he proposed a theory. And let me tell you a very, very interesting thing. He had an explanation for phantom limb pain even. And that explanation is similar to the explanation which we have today. Why, what causes phantom limb? Limbs is chopped off, but the nerve endings are there. So the nerve endings getting stimulated gives the feeling that the hand's still there. René Descartes, the philosopher, the mathematician who lived in 1664, explained that, look, there is a phantom limb phenomenon. And, but he believed that the body was more like a machine, the machinistic view, not the soul view. And the pain was a disturbance that passed along the nerve fibers until the disturbance reached the brain. Next slide, please. Dr. Thomas, I don't feel like interrupting you, but uh, uh, I'm supposed to do that yes. because we are running short of time. Yes. Uh, can you please uh, make it uh, a uh, bit hurry? I'll rush uh, through it, yes. It is fascinating. The history is always yeah. fascinating. Uh, yeah, I, know. I understand. I understand. I'll just kind rush through this. Kind of Let me see if I, how fast I can go, as I said. Um, well, so the Renaissance changed the whole concept of pain. And there's this beautiful diagram by René Descartes who's explained that the, next slide please, because we are going faster. Um, the, there's this boy sitting near a flame, the, the nerve which getting stimulated near the legs, going all the way up to the brain. But he believed that it was a hollow tube and the movement of the animal spirit was pulling on somewhere near the ventricles like a bell, pulling the bell, opening up certain pores near the ventricles causing the muscles to act and the leg to be moved away. But it's mostly what the diagram, which was drawn later, was about the boy looking at the legs. So it has to do with something to do with vision rather than the actual per se pain. So which means that Descartes did not understand that there was a nerve which was going all the way, although the picture gives us the impression that that's the case. Next slide, please. Two important theories were that of the specificity theory and the intensity theory, which again came in the 18th and 19th century. Next slide, please. So in the specificity theory, we have people like Charles Bell, Johannes Müller, and Moritz, which essentially said that 
look, there are specific receptors for different modalities of pain. Next slide, please. And so there were people who explained that there was receptors like Cross, William Cross, Cross in blood, I believe you've learned all that. And Von Frey who described pain spots on the skin of subjects. This all happened in the 1800s. So there's a huge scientific advancement in those years in the 1800s. Next slide, please. So now we know about Piscinian corpuscles, Meissner's corpuscles, Merkel's discs, and Rufini's end organs, uh, which all happened in 1835, 53, 75, and 93. Next slide, please. Now this intensity theory, this also happened parallelly, which means that there was no specific receptors, but rather multitasking receptors. So any kind of stimulus could be taken in. Depending on the intensity, they were perceived in different ways. For example, a mild touch could become painful if there was more number of nerve impulses traveling through it. So it's understandable. So we, we also believe in the pattern theory now, right? So this also happened during the time, and these were the proponents, Erasmus, Alfred, Edward. Thank you. Next slide, please. So now we reach the gate control theory, which all of you are aware. I'm not going to the details, but I'd like to quote what uh, Melzack said. Melzack actually said, that I believe it was the emphasis on the CNS mechanisms. Never again after 1965 could anyone try to explain pain exclusively in terms of the peripheral mechanisms. Okay. Next slide, please. So this is the, yeah, the, the, the best part of the presentation. I would believe the theory, the, the different ways in which people actually treated pain. Magic, rituals and prayers, ancient rattles, gongs, and uh, ways of frightening painful devils out of people's body and the American Indians who actually did hell whole pipes against the person's head to pull out, suck out the pain or the illness. Next slide, please. Um, you're aware about uh, trepanations. You're also aware that willow bark extracts, which contain salicylic acid, were chewed right from the time of Hippocrates. And this interesting thing about Egyptians, if there was a wounded part, they would put that part in water and put an electrical uh, fish, an eel for instance, and then that would relieve pain. Now think about this. This kind of an electrotherapy is what's now used in various ways like TENS or spinal cord stimulation or TBS. So the principle was understood back in those days when the Egyptians did this with the electric eels. Next slide please. Now, opium has been there from time immemorial. Sumerians, the Sumerian civilization used as a catapotium pill, which is poppy based. And if you look on the right side, that's Queen Nefertiti giving opium to her husband to please him, because opium was not just relieving pain, but giving you a good feeling as well. So in China, also they had the system. India also had the system. So if you look at all the ancient civilization, there has been extreme uses of Poppy or opium, 